Um, good to see you all. Really good to see you, so Luna's from um, New Orleans. Thank you for your help. So this is a great help. Um, so what we have today is we have this conversation around um, longing and the sensation of longing. And um, I want to begin here by why don't we just take a moment and um, just settle into ourself. Just settle in. And we can feel ourselves connecting to the earth and anchoring ourselves by our feet on the floor. Our seat on the chair. And without prejudice or discrimination or judgment, just notice where your breath is. I mean, and probably you'll see as soon as you notice where your breath is, that will change. And here we can take this view of we have time, we live in the past, we live in the present, we live in the future, long horizons of time. And there's a piece by Goethe, Johann Wolfgang, Wolfgang von Goethe, that I'm going to read parts of. And the title of it is called The Holy Longing, The Holy Longing. And he says, tell a wise person or else keep silent. And what he's referring to is this longing that a number of us come to. And it's a longing that is really distinct from having any kind of uh, a desire for something. In other words, that we are so conditioned by being consumers, our longing often gets confused with, oh, I, I need this, or I have a desire for that, distinct from what we can really call a spiritual longing. So when he says, tell a wise person or else keep silence, for those who do not understand will mock it right away. So as human beings, and I know many of you are coaches or therapists, or you work with people, and <clears throat> if you've done it long enough, you notice that in the people that you work with, and certainly in yourself, there is this, there's a sensation. There's a sensation for something that would return us to, we can call it many things, the more the far away, close at hand, the source, our essence, our, our authenticity, who we are. Tell a wise person or else keep silent. For those who do not understand will mock it right away. In the calm waters of the love nights where you were begotten, where you have begotten, a strange feeling creeps over you as you watch the silent candle burning. Now you are no longer caught in the obsession with darkness and a desire for a higher lovemaking sweeps you upward. And so long as you have not experienced this, to die and so to grow, you are only a troubled guest on the dark earth. So this notion of a longing and it's really often beautifully said by the Persian mystics. They call it farik, farik or duri, which means homesickness. And we know the, the word nostalgia, which comes from the Greek is two parts, nos and algia, which means, again, we could translate it as a homesickness. And those, those of us that are here in begin to have a reflective life, or a life of path, or a life of some intent about uh, what is my place here? And how do I bring the most essential part of myself here? Now our socialization is always at play 
in us and our conditioning is always at play. But there is clearly a place where we can touch that is much more essential to ourself. Um, a Persian poet in the 10th, 10th century, Abu Sa'ib Abil Kir in the 10th century, he says, remember to seek the beloved without the aid of reasoning. And when they use the word beloved, often the word they'll use will be yar, which is like the friend, to seek the beloved. And again, while they really personify it, we can think of that as to seek our deep authenticity, to seek our source, to seek union with a creator. Remember to seek the beloved without the aid of reasoning. One's own intellect cannot be used to, to comprehend one's own creator. And that's where we come in when we talk about the sensation of longing. And how is that a felt feeling? And let me speak through these certain distinctions here of sensation, which means it's felt as a temperature. It's felt as a movement inside of us. It's felt as a shape just as you feel your sit bones right now or, or your back against the chair or your feet on the floor or however your hands are, that feeling, that's, that sensation begins in us. And that can begin in many, many places, that sensation. But for right now in the short period of time we have together, let's consider that sensation beginning right in our chest. So let me suggest that you take the, your left hand, the palm of your left hand, and just touch your own chest. Really without concept, without reasoning behind it. Touch your chest so you're, you'll feel the sensation of your chest under your hand. And you'll feel the sensation of your hand through your chest. And if you drop your hand, but keep your attention right in that place in your chest, right where the, the heart is, the lungs are, those large pumps, oxygen being transferred into blood, that blood being transferred through our body, that being life, breath, blood, life. And I want you to follow me here. And if it becomes difficult for some reason, just stay relaxed into it and just see what might open. That the, the sensation in the chest, if we feel ourselves there, becomes, a, uh, becomes an impulse. In other words, we might feel it as a vibration or a pulsation. Some of you might even feel the pulse or your heart beating. You know, we can do that at our wrist or at our neck. But I want you to sense, feel, or imagine that impulse or pulse at your heart center. And then from there, let yourself opening up that that impulse becomes a yearning. In, in other words, it has, it has a direction. Now, as soon as I said that it has a direction, what, what, came, what came to form for you? Like what, what is the shape of your yearning? And if nothing is very clearly right at hand in the beginning, again, let that be okay. There's sensation, there's impulse. 
there's an urge. People are writing it into the chat, something spreading an up and an out, an urge and then a, a yearning. Now, right here, I want you to recall that those of you that have been around ch young children, either as parents, maybe as an older sibling, maybe as an aunt or an uncle, uh, maybe just observing children yourself, you'll see inevitably there will be a time when they will be at the a safe place around a safe person and they want up and they'll reach their hands up like this and they'll look up. Remember all of my children are doing that at some time and in doing that they said something like up or uppy or simply this shape that they had of this reaching up was a, was a call, was a longing to be picked up to get closer, to have a different view, really to be in my arms, really be in the, at that place. Still the parent is the, is, the, is the universe, is the center of the universe. And we see that, we see that shape in many paintings, and we see that shape in many statues, in other words, we see it in art, and we see that there are people, primarily pre-industrialized cultures, indigenous people and pre-industrialized cultures, who will have this practice that they will do often in the morning, often collectively, sometimes individually, where they will sing a song or they will recite something or they will reach up towards the sun as it's rising. So let's take a moment. I want you to take a moment with yourself very much anchored into the ground, into the earth. We're right here. And from this right here, we feel that there's something that is pulling us towards it. Source, the great luminous emptiness, an awakening. To original self before before our face. And let your breath come into your chest and breathe deeply into the chest, maybe two, three, four times. So that which is the more, we're not constructing it. it. It is already around us. And it actually has a place inside of us. And that place has a sensation, an impulse, an urge, a yearning and a longing to move towards, I'll use that word, to, to the home. Now let's open our palms and really as you open your palms, extend your fingers and keep that extension. So they're not even curled in a little bit. They're just really open as if you're receiving. You see many people in some religions when they're praying, they'll hold their palms up or if they're in front of an awakened person, they'll have their palms up as or in order to receive. Now let's extend out and let's bring up like we're looking up and right from this chest, almost being very open to being pulled up by that longing. You're breathing in through your nose, but breathing deeply. Mm -hmm. 
Just take one more deep breath. Let that breath out, let your hands come down. And let's just take a moment and just feel here. What shifted in temperature, what shifted in movement or shape, or was there an image that appeared as you were reaching up Deep within our DNA, among other reflexes, there's two reflexes that begin to move us when we're infants. And one is called the tonic reflex and one is called the labyrinth reflex. And the rab labyrinth reflex moves us our head down. It moves us our head down towards the earth if we're laying flat. But it also helps us when we're held by our mother or that caregiver, that our head will move towards the breast, towards nourishment. The other reflex, the tonic reflex, is that which brings our head up. Our eyes come up, our head comes up, and as we begin to follow that, we'll start to roll. That's called log rolling. And that's really what I'm saying is that those two things are very, very deep in us. We, science will call that our DNA. And how about if today we call that, that's very deep in our spirit, the spirit to go towards the nourishment labyrinth back towards the earth. The other impulse is to go up, up, which eventually moves our head up, strengthens our neck muscles. So then we can come on all fours and, and, and then come to standing. So what I want to point here is that this motion here is a very, very old archetype. And when we go into that motion, things that we can attend to are, number one, simply is there something in us that is resistant to that archetypal shape? Is there something that's in us in which we, we think of um, I don't uh, deserve this. Um, I, I haven't earned my stripes to be able to go to this larger more, to, to, the, to the vast unbounded uh, before being birthed, never dying space. Or I'm afraid to do that. All of those things in coming up in that shape where we breathe into that shape, we can attend to what arises inside of that. That we does not give us the permission, the grace to, to do something like that. Let's just try it again. Let's just reach up. Just like that tonic reflex, your head is coming up. Your hands are open. And then coming down. And as, as Abdul Kahir said, let's not go to reasoning there. Let's just feel for a moment. What does that open for you? For myself and where I'm situated right here, and I look out this window, what it opens up is that I'm just seeing things more distinctly. I can see actually the aliveness that's happening when the sun is breaking through the fog, the morning fog. And the, the dew is still resting on the, on the grasses, which provokes in me and innovates in me this feeling of deep, deep sense of belonging and gratefulness. I'm not saying that may be so for you, but it's if we take this kind of a shape, we take this very old archetypal shape, does it help us remember something?
In other words, there's amnesia. We all have an amnesia towards what our really true home is, what our really true sense of being is, who we really are. This body, this particular shape of our livingness keeps us moored to this life and moored to this life in a positive way where we can allow ourselves and others to feel more safe and secure where it's possible to live with less violence, no violence. That this is a place where we're moored here, where we can go, how do I, how do I hold myself in dignity? And how do I hold others in dignity? And moored in the sense that, no, I belong here. I have a place on this earth and I'm a child of the universe and I'm not separate. And there's another shape of our livingness that is not moored to these senses, that is boundless. It's not the medical body of parts, but it's a larger shape that actually can move out to the farthest corners of our perceived universe. That may be thousands and thousands of miles to a loved one, it could be to the farthest galaxies. And where we are both music and dance and light. So in this reaching, is it possible for us to move out of our amnesia about who we really are and move into what is called an anamnesia? An anamnesia is a, is a remembering. It's the opposite of amnesia, it's a remembering. And our longing starts to become a remembering. Now, the other place uh, of the many places we can use this shape to enact this remembering, or I think literally it means uh, forgetting to forget. You're not forgetting anymore, forgetting to forget. So that's a term we can chew on for a long time. But this notion that um, uh, our, our mouths, our lips, in our tongue, in our mouths, which are actually the very same tissues as our genitals, is the primary editor. That when you think of a somatic development, the child will take something and one of the first things it will do, will put it in its mouth. The mouth has taste and it feels what that is. But even previous to that, this is the place where our, in our deep D DNA, as I said, where we have a reflex towards moving towards nourishment. We're moving towards the breast for that nourishment. So let me suggest that we take a moment here and as we reach up, we'll reach up in a minute, but I want you to engage, just as you engaged in your chest, bring your attention to your mouth and your lips. And if you've seen a child take the breast, it'll open its mouth and it'll actually extend out towards it. So as we're extending this way, we're also opening the lips and opening the mouth as if we can take a shape, a very old and deep archetypal shape that opens us up to this deeper longing for what the Sufis will call uh, the beloved or the friend or the creator or the creator spirit or the Takimusu Aiki in different languages said many different ways that we begin to then really connect with this homesickness. And we begin to shape our life around that returning to that. We do that while we're still having our feet on the ground, doing what we have to do. But inside of us, that fire is burning around, no, I want to move towards and be touched and be again uh, held 
really held and surrounded by that, that loving, that loving embrace of the universe. Let's open our hands, extend out, reach up with your chest, and be present in your mouth and your lips too. Coming down. Let's take just a moment feeling ourselves in that. Like I said in the beginning, you can also notice the places where the resistance may come up. But just let that, just notice that. Let that pass. And then come to that place in which we feel a different kind of life in our shape now. Some of you may have done that inside of this narrative of longing or a homesickness in reaching out for more at this particular intersection or stage of your life. And maybe something really came to you. Maybe for some of you, you just really felt the increased sensation, the increased life, and had your own particular responses to that. Without it being yours, an example would be is that when I reached up and just didn't even think of like that I was yearning. I was just taking a shape, a very old, old shape, and an important shape and opening up to that and reaching up. What came to me was that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm yearning for, I'm longing for something from what I would call the universe, our spirit guides, the greater knowing about What's the next step for me? And that, that's critical for me because I just written another book, spent a lot of time in it and was engrossed by it and learning from it and suffering in it and joyful in it. And then I turned it in. I use all those adjectives before because it was such a big letting go. And while I'm really enjoying, I've enjoying these months of this open space and finding my way in it and just being present with what is, I can feel this other longing coming up. Like what is the longing for, as I did that, what is the longing for me to go into this next intersection? So let's do that again. And why don't you, if it's at hand, why don't you take a question with it? Or take your longing, if you know what that longing is, Open your shape to that longing so you're actually saying it. Like me, if you don't know, just take the shape, but with the narrative of what, what is the, the more, what is the greater? What is the source telling me now? Hands ready to receive, heart and chest ready to receive. So reaching up through the breath, through the mouth, and then reaching up through the eyes. And let's come down. and feeling. Just being with.
in the body work that we've developed at Strozzi is one of the things we do is the person is lying down either on a table or on a mat on the floor is we have them take that shape and allow energy to move through that shape and to then have what is that what is that what is the story of that shape what is the what is the story that that energy is telling inside of that shape So let me stop right here and maybe somebody might want to come on, ask a question or just say pretty briefly, because I'd like to hear from a number of you, what occurred for you there? If you would like to come off of mute, please raise your hand. Um, your digital hand, which is um, should be at the bottom of your screen. Fantastic. Okay, I guess it's my turn. Hello. My question is about. Actually, I want to. I can't see you, Richard. Can't let me do that. Okay. Um, my question is about how to reconcile longing with satisfaction, because one of the places I've been really trying to build my competency is around feeling more satisfied. Uh, <laughs> and I feel like, you know, there's obviously a paradox um, between these and there's an acceptance maybe of that paradox, but I just would love to hear um, some thoughts. And so as I see you. Yeah, good, good to see you. Um, well, congratulations on I'm I'm moved by your your commitment to to be able to be satisfiable. That's that's a beautiful thing to have to be satisfiable. One of the things that I've seen is that um, that when we we as evolving beings, if I become satisfied and I can live in my satisfaction and live in it in a very centered way, centered, present, accountable, open, committed way, is that in my evolvement, this next longing will come. And so each level of satisfaction gets built, builds a bigger and bigger base to move towards the, 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 the boundlessness are the next place of growth that we're moving in. So um, that's what I've been shown. That um, you know, and that in learning to be satisfied, we also begin to refine our levels of satisfaction. So maybe the the Mars bar that used to satisfy us, that doesn't satisfy us anymore. So that we realize that in my spirit or in my soul that longing is for something even larger or maybe more ineffable that we can speak of. But each one of those where we go, oh, I'm satisfied with this and I'm grateful for it becomes a, uh, a ground for the next piece. Not like we're dissatisfied or not like I have to keep trying for something, but there's a, the, the universe is growing Mystics have always known that. Now science tells us that we're always growing. So it's really to really have trust and confidence in that part of you that's always growing. Is that good enough for now? Uh, so I can't hear you. I think you're telling me it, it's okay to. Yes, I hear you. Okay. Um, I was so touched. I it brought tears to my eyes, and it was such a beautiful reminder of the practice. How little, how small it can be to bring me back to myself. 
Mm. And I had been feeling, have been feeling really overstimulated for the past, I don't know, five days or a week. Um, lots of noise from neighbors and just lots of stimulation, lots going on. But just in that movement and hearing your voice, which is very, very calming, uh, I just felt more grounded and more in my body. And it also, that movement, you mentioned children reaching up. It also reminded me of when my dad was dying and he kept lifting his hands up, his arms, his arm up in that way and looking mm -hmm. up and then he would rest. And then he did that for about 45 minutes. And I just watched him do that. And I was, I was thinking I was about 20 and I wasn't sure what was going on, but I knew it was something that I shouldn't interrupt and just witness. And so I feel touched for a number of reasons, but just really grateful for the reminder to just, it can just be very simple to come back to myself. Yeah, thank, thank you, Tanara. And thank you for the, um, thank you for that intimate story about your father. Thank you for that. I, I've also, um, uh, I never witnessed that with either my mother or father when they passed, but I've witnessed that with other people who've passed. It's that same gesture. And um, also for reminding us that by really um, uh, understanding these certain shapes that we can take can remind us of something or that are can settle us of something. And if we just take that moment and that pause to um, take that shape, uh, it may be a reaching, maybe a sitting still, maybe a palms up or palms down, thanking the earth that th these things can occur. And, and that, um, yeah, we, and aside from the, the sphere of our personal lives, you know, we live in this, this epidemic of anxiety. Huh? And um, the, the uh, horrific violence that's happening um, around law enforcement, and law enforcement, and people of color. And, you know, we have 160, 160 wars going on around the globe. And um, it's, it's, we're learning to build a shape that can be in love and recognize love as the powerful energy. And also knowing that there's pain and suffering going on and where can we take action there? So thank you, Tim. thank you. Good morning, Richard. Morning, Joanna. Thank you, as always. I, um, my immediate sense of the form and the shape was one of a chalice and um, it's a simultaneous offering and receptivity and celebration and apology. Mm. There's so much in it. And um, it brought deep tears and um, your telling of the story of your children brought even more tears. And as I was listening to others, what I was also reminded of was I was a tree climber as a kid. I loved to climb anything. And the main movement in climbing is the arms up and pulling and reaching and climbing. And then with one tree uh, or any tree, you go as far as you can go. But the impulse is still there and there's some now recognition that it's not about the tree. It's a, an inborn longing for ascension from the amnesia, from the encasement of this form world. And most specifically in this moment, your work has brought me in touch with the amnesia and response to some attacks, violence in my very close world, which is small. And uh, so 
you know, amnesia and closure, pulling back and sensing I need to continue reaching and opening, receiving. Thank you, Joanna. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, this is uh, my second time here, but first time in over a year. And one thing that I noticed as I did that movement was that it was very familiar. Um, I had gone on the pilgrimage to Mecca in 2017 and was urged on the Mount of Arafat to raise my hands towards God and to um, beseech of him his guidance and his nourishment and his clarity to humble myself and to um, orient myself beneath the creator's umbrella uh, in his bigness. And so when you asked us to do that, that shape felt very familiar. Mm. It made me feel really small and really big all at once in a really beautiful way. Um, it felt, it helped me feel like a child uh, and, and innocent and humble uh, in need of that nourishment and guidance and clarity from God. But it also made me feel really big and tall and wide. Um, and so just thank you for that. Um, it, it just helps me orient as I walk this earth um, big in myself, but also small beneath God. Mm. Thank you. You're welcome. Well said. So, do you pronounce your name Saeed? He may have muted himself, Richard. Okay. Raise his hand. I can bring him back off. Oh, thank you for uh, asking. My name is Sajid. Sajid, yeah. Um, uh, are you beginning Ramadan? Yeah, today's the first day. First day today, yes. Yeah, first day. Yeah, well, may your Ramadan produce the, the benefits and gifts that you wish for. And um, thank you for uh, reminding us of the many cultures and ways and religions that people take, take this gesture. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there. Um, morning. My name is Jen. Um, my experience maybe feels a bit unique. Um, I definitely feel like the pathway to that connection and, and aliveness is so readily available. Um, but I think there's some kind of restriction that happens for me around receiving. And it's like a visceral res restriction that I felt in that practice. So the, the felt sense was when I brought my hands down, like I could feel a sense of aliveness. And then also this tightening in my jaw and neck. Um, and it's kind of activating actually to talk about it, but what I'll share is just awareness of when I was born, that the, the cord was wrapped around my neck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's a, so it just feels like, uh, I guess what I, I experienced lately is just this real pull, like to bring more of myself forward. And then I feel that restriction or that restriction is the thing I bump up against. So it's just, um, what happened for me was just really being able to experience that physic on a physical level that like reaching that like reaching out to receive um I don't know if it's received but that like making myself you know come more forward and then like this feeling of tightening or something <laughs> so I wanted to just share that experience it's it's just I don't know what you <laughs> you would have to offer that yeah thank you thank you Jen um I, I, I think that um, what you're bringing forward here is a, 
really important piece because it's not uncommon for many of us in the sense that, as I said before, that in that reaching out or that opening for more in whatever degree that we do that, that will invoke these, the, a number of responses. One that can be, um, I'm not, I'm not deserving or I'm not big enough to take that, or maybe that's too much responsibility I'm on and on and on in that way. And one of the ways I think to really begin to, in other words, that, that, that to feel that constriction I would hold is one of the things that was just given to you. Yeah. Not like it was new, but you go, Oh, I'm, this is what is, you're not saying constrict yourself. It's just coming up. And, you know, they're really the, one of the ways to look at that is to really let yourself move into where it actually is in your tissues, where it actually is in your muscles, where it's in your breath patterns, and what happens when this choke happens, what, what other part of the body also begins to constrict. Mm -hmm. And by noticing that, um, it will be an informant, uh, um, a, 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 an ally in letting you know, like, oh, I'm not receiving yeah. So one of the really powerful things I think that I know has been for me is that when people give me an appreciation or give me love, I've learned, I've had to learn how to let that in. Right. Yeah. I wanted it. I longed for it. And then when it would come, I realized there were places that I would deflect it or not really let it penetrate me. The intimacy of that penetrate me. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, this, we could have a really long conversation about <laughs> this and we could work with this even right now, but really just a, attending to the actual sensation of the contraction when, when you open. Yeah. When you, mm. What I would say, like, if, from what you shared and like if the reflection is it does feel like a gift to just feel the physical sensation without all the story you know and just so i so yeah thank you and just to be with that experience is the, the practice yeah thank you for that sharing that's an intimate sharing i appreciate that yeah okay. one of my yeah. one of my children when they were born they had the their cord wrapped around their neck too at that moment mm -hmm. and uh, We've had many conversations about that, how that may show up later. Yeah. Hi, Mom. Hi, Richard. Um, and before we jump, I just wanted to remind everyone that we are having in-person courses come back again on the ranch. Um, we will have an embodied transformation course May 20th through the 23rd. There also will be our online transformation course foundations coming back, which was previously um, um, embodied leadership core that will be online. So there's so much rich richness that you offer to us here, Richard, but I wanna invite people to like go deeper into this work um, and anything else that you want to share before uh, people all exit. <laughs> at the yeah, let, let me say this is that, um, uh, our apologies again for being late. And um, I know people have schedules, but I'm willing to stay for maybe a little bit longer. Do we have time technologically to go a little bit longer? So what I can do is I'm gonna make you the host. I have okay. a student call right now that I need to go to, but um, you are all in really good hands as Richard is the host and we'll go a little bit longer. Um, Richard, of course, you can text me if there are any challenges on the text. Side. All right, thank you so much, Solalinus. Oh, thank you. Pleasure. So if you need to go, good seeing you, lots of love to you. Um, and I'm gonna be the host. I've never done this before, so. Um, let me go to um, Carolyn and you unmute Carolyn and come on board. Hi, hi. Thank you. Thank you for the beautiful practice. I just wanted to make a connection with something that happened for me a long time ago when I had a lot of depression. 
And I had this moment of just bringing my arms in the air, not as full as the practice you guided with us today, but the difference between having my arms down and having my arms up was the difference between depression and hope, if you like, or death and life, you know, one could say many things. And it was really beautiful to go the kind of full depth today with you. I appreciated it because it was like the postgraduate version of, you know, and then to go to that level of joy and reception receptivity so mm -hmm. I just wanted to share that connection I'd made it's been a long time since I'd thought of that yeah thank you Carolyn what, what, what a beautiful connection yeah deep um let's go to psoas massage if you would unmute sorry I uh, meant to log out so that doesn't come up as my business name but I'm Jenny hi Richard nice to see you Hi. Um, I was, uh, um, when you're talking about the labyrinth uh, reflex, um, it just brings me back to uh, being a child and my, um, my mom didn't breastfeed me because it was during a time that she thought that um, uh, formula was better. And um, it also reflects that um, there were many things in our you know, relationship that was a little bit more superficial. And so I crave, I find myself as adult craving that nourishment that I didn't get then. And I'm trying to get to a deeper level of connection. And so I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts around as a child, if you didn't have that, that uh, connection, that nourishment, that innate connection with your mother if you have thoughts around how to find that nourishment, you know, where, where as an adult, where you can go with that labyrinth reflex. Mm -hmm. Let me ask this question. Um, do you feel pretty competent at asking for what you need? I am getting better at it. Mm -hmm. And um, fill in for me when you say getting better at it, um, uh, what does that mean? That means that it's a practice of mine. So there's certain um, categories in my life that I'm better at than others. And there's places that I'm, I'm still working on it. Uh -huh. um, so I will practice it. And it's, it's something that I think about. Yeah. And what is your reflections when you when you ask for what you need? And then when that comes to you about actually receiving it? Hmm. Well, when you just talked about that before that connected with me that um, I'm, I'm in that space a little bit right now that I'm actually receiving what I've many things that I've been working for and asking for. And I'm uh, finding a hard time accepting the, the ease and the, the beauty of that. Um, so yeah. Are you willing to do a uh, very short practice with me right now? I'm a little bit nervous, but I'm willing. <laughs> uh huh. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for uh, ponying up here. And this is something that you can do, and many of you can do, uh, um, if you're if you're working with the same kind of conundrum uh, that you're saying. And um, so um, I want you to get centered here, and I, I'm going to say something to you. I'm going to say something to you, and um, I want you to allow it to come in as much as you want to. And then when you feel that you're ready, nod your head. And then when I say it, I want you, I want you to let it go in and then just settle with it for a moment. And then I'll ask you what that was like, okay? Okay. You ready? Yes, I'm ready. Um, I want to acknowledge and appreciate uh, you sharing with us that very intimate part of your life. And um, I'm sure that was very, very helpful for other people. Um, and I recognize that it was a moment of probably, it could have been a, a moment of vulnerability and you had the resoluteness uh, to step forward and to say that. Thank you.
Now, let me, let me suggest now you say to me, say my name and say, I'm letting in your appreciation. Richard, thank you. I'm letting in your appreciation. And there's a lot of emotion with it. And it feels really nice at the same time that it's challenging to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Living in those contradictions and it feels nice and it's challenging too. Yeah. So um, let me suggest that when you receive something like that and you, you do body work, is that correct? I do, but mostly I'm, I'm running the clinic where other people are doing body work. I see. So <laughs> we get acknowledgement that whenever you feel that that acknowledgement comes in, if it's appropriate, say that to the person, I'm letting your love in. I'm letting your acknowledgement in. If it's like socially awkward or not appropriate, um, just say it to yourself. I'm letting that appreciation in. And doing it in a way where you're really in, in your body. Great. All right. Have a good time. Thank you. Have a good time being nourished and appreciated. Okay. I will. <laughs> yeah. Elizabeth, would you unmute? Hello. I'm here. Hi. Thank you for, hello everyone. Um, something made me sign up for today's talk and longing is the word, it's a very intimate word for me. It's almost like I don't allow myself to long. And so I was very interested. And last night, as I was going to sleep, a uh, little background, I have two sons and one of them just became a father two months ago. And we have tension with each other right now. And um, I treasure this little clip of, a, of the two month old uh, girl that uh, he and his wife had. And I look at it again and again and again and, and it's very hard for us to connect. And last night as I was going to sleep I have to, I remembered when he was two years old and he would, and I had been on a trip and I came through the door and he said, mommy, uppy, uppy, like this. And I couldn't believe how it, it's about my longing and how there's something so deep and in memory that connects everything for us. And and, the, and I'm, I'm on a um, sort of sol solitary retreat for myself right now. And, and just how that's all accessible, all that, all those veins are there. And, um, and I also, in listening to what you were saying and what other people were saying, I, am, I became very aware of how in reviewing his childhood, even when I woke up this morning in my meditation, um, how every time it, it felt like this effervescent love felt like too much. And I remember re like there's something inside of me that rejected him and his love and his purity of loving me. It felt like too much. And I think that's at the core of this wound that we have together. Um, so I'm really glad that I followed my, my something to just sign up. Mm. Elizabeth, do you, do, you, do you reflect that that might be a good thing to share with your son? Yeah, I was thinking that. Mm -hmm. Right. You, you remind me that um, I found that uh, longing and sorrow are very, very close. Oh, it always feels so painful. Yeah. And the deeper that we are allowing ourselves to go into our sorrow or go into loss yeah. and the sorrow of loss is that it really can throw logs on the fire 
of, of our longing. And so part of that is really that we are, we're learning how to be with sorrow, huh? Not try to override it. So thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Have a good retreat. Thank you. Marlene. Hello, I'm Marlene and thank you very much. Um, something happened during this for, for me and I'm crying a lot. Um, I'm really challenging my beliefs around my longing for beauty and perfection. And it's almost childish and I'm 66 years old and I experienced an irony, irony. I have, I received the most beautiful dog in the world. She was bred for ultimate beauty by her breeder but she has a genetic defect from this type of breeding that has come up now at her age of three years. I've had her three years. She only knows me. And this defect will now disfigure her. And um, I vacillate between wanting her to go away and be dead already and not exist and my love for her, which says this ironic human error that is making this animal suffer is challenging my belief about being attached to beauty and aesthetic beauty and, and what society says is beautiful and how I haven't been able to sit with her glaucoma eye that has to be removed and I act I'm dramatic and I feel like I'm in a horror movie this in, the most beautiful thing about her is her mane and her eyes and the only answer is a spiritual connection because there's nothing human that can relieve me and um, I had a complete collapse the other day and I'm afraid for my sanity and, um, but now through this, I have a little bit of peace that says you're facing your belief that is completely irrational, that life does not include illness and death. It includes all of it. And I have not been in unconditional acceptance of it. And um, I'm around people who have lost loved ones and have much more greater grief. And I don't comprehend how they have the courage to sit with that and go through it and not want to run away or end the life of the disfigured or ill person. You don't end the life of a person but I don't feel I can go through this and have her eyes removed because it's going to go to the other eye and have a blind dog that I have to guide. To me, it's overwhelming. I want it to all go away. And that's just not how it is. So um, I'm going to keep coming to you and look at your other videos because I'm not a very spiritual person. I'm kind of a new beginner. I have a book on the shelf that says spiritual imperfection and it's the imperfection of daily life and being able to be with sorrow and suffering. I love what you said and thank you very much. Thank you, Marlene. And um, keep reaching out to people during this trying time. Um, thank you all for staying. I wish I could have this conversation all day. I, I need to move on. Um, thank you all for being here. And again, apologies for the technology piece and um, more to come. <laughs>